Hi, Maria. Are you with us? I sure am. How are you? Fantastic. Terrific. Okay. Hi, everybody. So our next presenter is Maria Karimbakis joining us from Milton, Massachusetts on how to thrive on a short bowel syndrome diet. Maria, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to join you today remotely. Um, if you're having trouble hearing me or need me to do anything different, Andrea, just speak up. I will um, get moving along here and um, I'll look forward to questions at the end. Okay. So just to uh, give you a little bit more information um, about me, I'm a clinical dietitian and I work um, at ThriveRx, a home infusion um, provider, and I've been providing clinical care um, as a dietitian for over 20 years for our short bowel um, consumers. And I worked at the very first intestinal rehabilitation program called the Nutritional Restart Center. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about this very important topic. Um, and I just always like to mention at the beginning of my presentations, just to be sure that, you know, we're, we're working today to educate on different topics and my topic being diet. Um, but I always encourage you to uh, take the information that you learn um, from a presentation like this and bring it back to your medical team before making any changes to your regimen. So as I mentioned, we're going to focus on uh, diet strategies specifically for short bowel syndrome and other malabsorptive disorders. Um, but before I, I outline those key diet modifications um, that are really so very necessary for a short bowel consumer to be successful, I'm gonna begin just with some background regarding the first intestinal rehabilitation program. Um, since today's emphasis on the importance of diet intervention really evolved from this program, so the bowel rehabilitation concept um, was initiated by Dr. Wilmore and Dr. Byrne at the Nutritional Restart Center more than 20 years ago. And as I mentioned, I was fortunate to work um, at the Nutritional Restart Center. Um, and I worked there for seven years and uh, was very fortunate to be part of this groundbreaking work. Um, the Nutritional Restart Center standardized bowel rehabilitation regimen um, consisted of a specific diet with supplements, medications, and a behavior modification program, um, which included comprehensive patient education in order to successfully incorporate the complete regimen into the lifestyle of the patient. And at that time, um, patients would travel to the Nutritional Restart Center for a four-week inpatient admission um, and followed by one to two years of outpatient follow-up. So pretty unique um, thinking about something like that um, today and sort of the medical um, you know, insurance world that we live in, but um, it was a pretty unique opportunity. Uh, so the primary goal of bowel rehabilitation was to eliminate reduce or prevent the need for long-term dependency on parental nutrition um, while maintaining the nutrition and hydration status of the patient. Um, and as mentioned, this concept was pione pioneered at the Nutritional Restart Center, um, but really has grown to be the model for intestinal rehabilitation nationwide today. And we're gonna talk more specifically about the diet. So the work at the Nutritional Restart Center really helps to define the role of an appropriate diet in short bowel management. Specifically, um, in caring for nearly 400 patients with short bowel syndrome over a 10-year period, uh, the Nutritional Restart Center's work, um, they help to recognize the significant adverse effect of an inappropriate diet on nutrient absorption, stool output, and medications. So although an appropriate diet does not guarantee optimal clinical response, an inappropriate diet can really negate the effects of a prescribed medication, such as an antidiarrheal, for example, or um, another uh, therapeutic intervention like growth hormone or um, tadouglutide or Gatex. So it's just really, I can't underscore enough the importance of the diet interventions. Um, the Nutritional Restart Center's work also designed their, you know, their program designed a specific diet for each patient according to the presence or absence of colon. And this helped to support earlier conclusions that were made by Dr. Norgard and his um, clinical team. 
And in addition, the Nutrition Research Center identified um, the importance of educating the patient on how to translate the diet prescription into appropriate foods, fluids, and meals, and helped patients achieve the optimal diet by individualizing the plan and providing ongoing follow-up. So we often find that patients have been told some, if not all, of the diet principles um, through various forms of education, but don't really know how to put the, what they've learned into practice. We're gonna speak more about that today as well. Okay, so uh, what you're looking at here is the comparison of the two diet prescriptions, which really are the cornerstone of the short vowel um, diet education. So although overall um, the diet principles remain the same, uh, this extensive research that I'm referring to has demonstrated that patients with a colon need a different percentage of nutrients than those without a colon. So as you'll compare, as you look between the two um, columns, uh, between colon and no colon, uh, those with a colon should consume a diet higher in carbohydrates. So you see there are 50 to 60% of total carbohydrates um, with limited simple sugars and lower in fat um, with a limited amount of oxalate uh, divided in five to six meals per day. Uh, those without a colon should consume a diet somewhat lower in carbohydrate, that 40 to 50% of total calories with restricted simple sugars, higher in fat, so you see 30 to 40% of total calories as compared to those with a colon, only 20 to 30% of calories from fat, um, divided in four to six meals per day. So in both diets, um, the percentage of protein is the same, uh, 20 to 30%, and isotonic fluids are recommended. We're going to talk about what that means in a moment. And soluble fiber should be used, generally speaking, when stool output is greater than three liters. And we're going to talk about that as well. Um, so let's just look at the difference in a little bit more detail. Um, the reason we recommend more total carbohydrate for those with a colon is because patients with a colon often have shorter segments of small bowel due to the underlying um, uh, disease process or um, resection um, than those with end um, jejunostomies and therefore have higher calorie needs. And a high carbohydrate diet can help meet these calorie needs through a process of colonic fermentation um, in which carbohydrates that are not absorbed in the small intestine really due to that small bowel length can actually be fermented in the colon into short chain fatty acids. Um, and then actually absorbed and utilized for energy. Um, so this process can't occur in those without a colon. So that's the big difference in why we push more carbohydrates in the diet for those um, with a colon. Uh, the reason less fat is recommended is because when more than 100 centimeters of ileum is resected, um, which is quite often the case in short bowel, um, bile salts, which are needed for fat absorption are malabsorbed in large amounts and eventually that bile salt pool gets depleted and a few things happen as a result. So when fewer bile salts are available, they limit the absorption of fat and fat soluble vitamins and then the malabsorption of fat causes a secondary problem because the unabsorbed fat then binds with calcium um, and then calcium is not available to bind up with oxalate. So it's like one thing causes the next thing. Um, and then as a result of those dietary oxalates not getting bound up, they go on and pass to the colon where they're reabsorbed and then excreted into urine. And those high oxalate levels over time can lead to kidney stones. So um, that's the reason why fat and dietary oxalates are limited for those with colon, and it's a non-issue for those without colon. Um, so now that I've reviewed the ideal prescription based on remaining bowel anatomy, colon versus no colon, um, let's discuss the specifics of translating the prescription into appropriate fluids, foods, and meals. So let's start with the fluids. And this honestly is a topic in and of itself. Um, this really, we could talk quite a bit, as I, as I just said, it really is its own topic. But what's the most important thing, you heard me say that the fluids should be uh, hypo or, or isotonic. And I want to explain what that means. When we talk about um, osmolarity, we mean 
um, the concentration of fluid. So that's uh, so when you see the word hyperosmolar, um, we're talking about the concentration of the fluid. And a hyperosmolar fluid is one that contains many particles of glucose in little uh, to no sodium. Uh, fluids like hyperosmolar fluids uh, cause fluid to be pulled into the intestinal tract to dilute the concentration of the drink. And as a result of that, it causes watery diarrhea. So the fluid that surrounds the GI tract um, is a certain concentration, and then you put a different concentration into the GI tract um, in the form of a fluid, uh, it can really cause some shifting. So the hypoosmolar fluids contain few to no particles of glucose and are not concentrated at all. So they're not always absorbed entirely. They're not necessarily um, difficult to, to tolerate, but they're not always fully absorbed. So the type of fluid that short bowel consumers do best with is what we call isoosmolar fluids. And these are fluids that contain sodium, potassium, and glucose in the same concentration as the blood and the fluid that surrounds the GI tract. And basically what this does is this fluid will not cause fluid to shift into the GI tract and instead does the opposite, helps someone to absorb fluid across the GI tract. Um, so the fluid that surrounds the GI tract has an osmolarity of between 275 to 295. So when you're looking here at this table, those hyperosmolar fluids, the ones listed here in red, um, with an osmolarity or a concentration of anywhere between 550 to 1265, have a very high concentration as compared to the blood plasma, remembering that that number is between 275 to 295. So you can see that with fluids with this type of concentration, they're gonna cause a lot of diarrhea. And then in the middle there in yellow is examples of hypoosmolar fluid, are things like uh, water and tea, diet soda, really any diet beverage that has where the sugar has been replaced. Um, there is very little concentration to those fluids, and they're very um, low in their concentration and a lot lower than the concentration of the plasma that surrounds the GI tract. Um, so those, like I said, don't get as optimally absorbed. And it's the ones in green, the ORS, the Cerulite, the Pedialyte, Gatorade, and to add to this list now, because there's a, this list is more expansive as time has gone on, there's trioral. Um, there's drip drop, there's H2ORS, um, so there are more um, selections, and these all fall into the category of being isotonic or isoosmolar, and are the same concentration of the fluid that surrounds the GI tract and get most optimally absorbed. Okay, so that's um, all we're going to say for the moment about fluid. Now we're going to talk about the macronutrients in the diet. We're going to start with carbohydrates. And we're going to get into the more specifics of that. So there are two major types of carbohydrates. There's both complex and simple. Um, complex carbohydrates are polysaccharides um, containing many glucose units. Um, what's tricky about this category is that it, um, it contains both starch and dietary fiber. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about fiber in a moment. Um, but complex carbohydrates should make up the bulk of the daily calories. Um, fiber is the non-starch component of plant cells that, in general, can't be digested or absorbed and is typically limited um, in the short bowel diet. So we'll talk, like I said, more about that in a moment. And then there's simple carbohydrates. This is the simplest form of carbohydrate. Um, it's the monosaccharide. It's one sugar unit. So simple carbohydrates or sugars generally should be avoided due to their small particle size and the effect on the concentration in the intestine. And we just spoke about that in regards to the type of sugars that are in fluids, but now we're talking about sugar in food. Um, so let's look here at examples of differences between simple and complex. So a simple carbohydrate are all the things that taste sweet. Uh, sugar, candy, cakes, cookies, and pies, regular soda, jelly, jams, and syrups, ice cream, so really um, dessert-like yummy, um, unfortunately, uh, yummy foods. Um, uh, the complex carbohydrates are the more starchy um, foods. They, they don't taste sweet. 
um, but they too are very good. Um, things like pasta, potatoes, breads, cereals, whole grains is tolerated. Um, and this is where your fruits and vegetables also come in, but we don't emphasize in the short bowel diet due to the fiber component to them. So we're gonna talk about that more. So the, the reason um, there's really, the way that carbohydrates are absorbed in the, in the GI tract of somebody with short bowel um, is so specific that it really, um, we wanna make a lot of emphasis on this because the amount and type of carbohydrate consumed really becomes critical to achieving and maintaining good nutrition in the short bowel diet. And just as I've been saying, since simple sugars cause an increase in the concentration of intestinal fluids due to their very small particle size, um, this results in diarrhea, malabsorption, loss of fluids, electrolytes, and vital nutrients. So it's really important, just like we spoke about, to get the fluid correct um, and making sure there's not too much sugar in what you're drinking, but in what you're eating is equally as important. And you're looking to limit the intake of simple sugars in general to less than 10 grams per meal or snack. And that's um, that number came from the work that was done at the Nutritional Restart Center. And instead of e eating high amounts of sugar, you want to replace that with complex carbohydrates to help reduce the diarrhea. Now, as I mentioned, those with a colon appear to benefit further from the high complex carbohydrate diet that, you know, 50 to 60% of total calories um, for the benefit of the fermentation that occurs. And again, this is only specific for those with a colon, but that's also another benefit to emphasizing the complex carbohydrates in the diet. Now, what do we do when we're trying to replace sugar? You know, it's very, it, it's challenging. Um, to avoid sugar, um, but there are thankfully some options for avoiding sugar, um, and there are alternatives to sugar that can have a more positive impact on the bowel. So there is a category of sweeteners called non-nutritive sweeteners. Um, they are very intense, very low calorie sweeteners that do not have an adverse effect on stool output since they do not contribute to that osmolality or the concentration in the GI tract. So these sweeteners can be used as an alternative to reduce simple sugars in the diet. And I'm speaking simply from the aspect that these do not have an impact on the GI tract. Um, whether you choose to use a sweetener or not, sorry, I just advanced that there, um, is totally an individual decision. Um, there has been a lot of testing and safety around these products, but there is a lot still that people, you know, question about their, their, um, you know, whether they're okay to use. And by no means am I saying these are you know, a perfect product and go use them. I'm just saying these are great from a GI tract standpoint that they will not cause diarrhea. And examples of that are things like that, you know, as um, aspartame, their um, brand names would be NutraSweet, Sugar Twin, or Equal. Um, things containing saccharin like Sweet and Low and Sweet Twin. Newer to, mar to the market, although it's been around now a long time, is sucralose, uh, marketed as Splenda. And then the next category, the um, uh, uh, I always have a hard time saying this word, acelpamine K, um, you may be less familiar with, Sunnet, Sweet Safe, and Sweet One. The, these tend to be more added in the um, food industry world. Um, for sweetening purposes, same with neotame. It's used by manufacturers in combination with other nutritive and non-nutritive sweeteners to enhance the flavor of food and beverages. And then there are the stevia-based sweeteners, things like Truvia, Purvia. Um, so those have um, are a little bit more um, um, organic in their uh, in their processing. Now. Of course, there's a caveat to alternatives to sugar, right? It just can't be simple and we can just go, you know, with the fact that something that's sugar-free is okay for a short bowel consumer. Unfortunately, there's another category called sugar alcohols. And sugar alcohols are also used as low-calorie sweeteners. But unlike the non-nutritive sweeteners that I just described, they are designed to be malabsorbed and cause uncomfortable side effects like abdominal gas bloating and diarrhea. So this actually 
is a category of ingredient that you want to avoid entirely if you're somebody with malabsorption. And even if you don't have malabsorption, it actually can cause some diarrhea. Um, sugar alcohols can be found in the ingredient list on the food label as sorbitol, mannitol, and xylitol. Um, and a product labeled sugar-free must contain a separate line for sugar alcohols under the carbohydrate section on the food label. And we have that circled here on the right-hand side. So you can see that this is where you would actually go to find out how many grams of sorbitol the product contains. And I'm always asked the question, well, how many grams can I tolerate as a short bowel consumer? And it is so individual. Um, but honestly, that number needs to be under five grams for sure, and in some cases under three grams. And I've even heard that consumers have trouble with chewing gum with sorbitol with as little as one gram per, you know, per piece. So that's something to keep in mind, even if you're not eating desserts that are sweetened with sugar alcohols, things like sugar-free mints and gum can, uh, especially because you, you don't usually have just one, um, that adds up throughout the day, and it's really important to be aware if that is something that you're doing and, and are prone to higher amounts of, of output. It's something to look at. Um, so sugar uh, replacers can be helpful, but there's a big caution sign. You have to be really uh, on the lookout for these sugar alcohols. Okay, so still within the carbohydrate um, category, but we're going to talk just a moment about fiber because, of course, this too has to have a type to make it a little bit harder. I always find that short bowel consumers are the best, um, they themselves could be the best dietitians because they have to know so much about food. Um, but So let me just differentiate soluble versus insoluble fiber and how it, it basically, they have two very distinct impacts on the, the intestine. So soluble fiber increases what we call the viscosity or the thickness of food mass, which delays stomach emptiness. So there's, you know, you get some, slowing down of the GI tract. And so um, this slowing down of, of movement or transit time in the small intestine allows more time for food and fluid to be absorbed, which is exactly what we want to happen. Um, so this soluble fiber passes through the small intestine undigested and enters the colon where it is broken down by bacteria in the colon, just like we were talking about. So additional calories are made from this fermentation process, just like other malabsorbed carbohydrates. Um, and there can be some positive because it can help you slow down the GI tract. But the reason we don't go and prescribe large amounts of soluble fiber for everybody is because uh, the large amounts may cause increased fat malabsorption, gas, and bloating. Um, so in the beginning days, back in the Nutritional Research Center, initially everybody was on soluble fiber, but over time, because of the risk of fat malabsorption, gas, bloating, and you know these sort of uncomfortable side effects, um, the ch the thinking changed, and really soluble fiber is used more for those that are not able to bring their stool output down with other means of diet interventions and anti-diarrheal. So when stool output stays, still stays higher than three liters, um, soluble fiber may be introduced as a strategy to help reduce output. Now, insoluble fiber sits on the total opposite spectrum. So insoluble fiber does not dissolve in water. It actually traps water. It increases stool bulk and volume, which is why it's pushed in the general American population because most uh, people are constipated and having more stool bulk and volume is, is desired. Um, but we, with a short bowel consumer, we're never looking to speed up movement or transit time in the small intestine, right? You're already having plenty of output. Uh, so there is, so insoluble fiber um, is just very much um, not agreeable to the GI tract. And in addition, it can contribute to bowel blockages in those consumers with narrowed areas of small intestine. So for, for both of those reasons, it's not recommended. So how do you know what has soluble fiber and what has insoluble fiber? And that can be a hard job. I'm going to just give you some examples here. Um, so 
the best fiber choices for short bowel consumers, and again, not to say that all consumers are going to do well with soluble fiber, but they're going to, you're going to do better with that versus insoluble fiber. So the examples on the left-hand side are the oatmeal cereals and breads, oat bran um, and br uh, cereals and breads, apples without their skin, um, applesauce, bananas. So these are all good examples of soluble fiber. Um, oranges, grapefruit, tangerines without seeds um, or membranous tissues and, and peelings. Um, strawberries are allowed in small amounts. You want um, cooked, peeled, and seedless vegetables such as carrots or butternut squash, asparagus tips, gr canned green beans, um, small amounts of refried low-fat beans or shelled beans. So these are examples that contain soluble fiber that in small quantities may be tolerated and actually may help to slow down the GI tract. The insoluble fiber is the, on the right-hand side is the category that we're talking about limiting um, because it increases stool output uh, and have an impact on stool output. Things like rosy, wheat bran, um, fruits such as grapes, blueberries, cherries, rhubarb. Um, you know, I, I don't have to read each one, but just to give you an example of a few things that are just not as well tolerated, and probably you're looking at this list saying, I know this already because you've had a bad experience with something like corn or celery, cucumbers, lettuce. Um, we often hear lettuce is, you know, just not well tolerated, um, and it is an insoluble fiber, and, and, and this is why. Um, and also nuts and large seeds are also generally not tolerated well in the short bowel diet. Okay, so I've talked a lot about carbohydrate and all the variables that go with carbohydrate. Um, and I'm sure there'll still be some questions around that. We're going to switch gears and talk about the next macronutrient, which is protein. Now, you're going to see one slide on protein, which is going to make you feel like this is not a very important topic, but protein actually is considered the go-to food in the short bowel diet. It generally is very well tolerated, especially lean sources of protein. Uh, what you're looking at here is types of dietary protein from highest quality to lowest quality, and these are all just good examples of, of good protein sources. And remember, you want your calories to come from 20 to 30% of protein. And what's simple about this category is, is that if you're choosing lean sources of protein, um, you know, chicken, fish, um, you know, beef that has been, you know, trimmed from fat and, you know, a higher percentage or lower percentage of, um, of fat um, in the ground meat, you're going to do well with the protein and the bowel does well with it. And there's sort of just no caveats. Like I just had to go through, you know, complex versus simple carbohydrates, soluble versus insoluble fiber. There's not a lot more to say about protein other than it is generally very well tolerated. And that's why we really encourage every meal and snack to contain a source of protein because it helps buffer um, the impact that other things in that meal or snack, for example, um, you know, if your meal or snack contains some sugar, the protein is going to help slow down the impact that the sugar can have on the bowel. Um, and same with fat. We're going to talk about fat next. But just the impact um, that it can have, um, it, the protein can really help to, uh, like I said, buffer sort of some of the other uh, ill effects of some of the other parts of the diet. So um, I can't underscore enough the importance of incorporating protein. And most consumers do a great job um, adding protein at mealtime. The harder time to incorporate it is usually snack time. And so that's where it gets, especially on the go, it just gets a little bit more tricky to be sure that you're getting protein um, at every meal and snack. And that's usually an area that we find we work on with our consumers pretty um, you know, pretty intensely in the beginning. In regards to fat, um, fat is, um, you know, a little bit tricky um, in that there are three different types of fat. Um, fat is a very important part of the diet, but, the, but not all fats are alike. Um, and foods that are high in animal fat and saturated fat are the types that should be limited in the diet. Um, so examples would include high-fat meats, butter, shortening, 
like whole milk products. Um, instead, you're looking to choose the low-fat forms of these products, such as you know lean meats, margarines, low-fat milks and cheeses. And the reason being is that um, foods high in animal fat and saturated fat, saturated fat's been correlated with heart disease, and there's really no upside. It doesn't contain what we're going to talk about in a minute called essential fat. So the body can make saturated fats on its own, and there's really not uh, any specific benefit. And because fat is generally not very well tolerated, um, it's something that you have to be really choosy about in the terms of the type of fat that you're, you're putting into your diet. Um, you don't want to sort of waste your fat choice on saturated fat that isn't going to benefit you. So instead, we want to channel all of your efforts towards essential fats. Um, since the body can't make essential fats, on their own. And when we talk about essential fats, what we mean is they're a type of fat that's found specifically in, in polyunsaturated fat. And what do we mean by polyunsaturated fat? That's a type of fat that you would find in soybean, safflower, or sunflower oil and products made with, with these oils. Things like regular mayonnaise, soft tub margarines, um, oil-based salad dressings. Those are examples of foods that contain essential fats. Um, and I'm going to give you some more examples. But again, the body cannot make this type of fat on its own. So oftentimes, short bowel consumers are told that the diet is a low-fat diet, and they like to think of it more as a modified fat diet. Because it's, it's, you can't be too lean because you need a certain amount of essential fat to avoid an essential fatty acid deficiency. But the, the fat needs to be very Select, you have to be very selective in your choice, and you can only likely tolerate a small amount um, at a time. Um, those with ostomies tend to do a little bit better with fat, a little bit more fat at a time than somebody um, with a colon. Um, but again, I'm speaking in general terms, in generally, um, the, the fat is uh, something that you're, it's so individual. I mean, the entire diet is so individual, but in terms of how much fat you tolerate is so incredibly individual. But when you're adding fat, you want to be sure that you're adding it in the form of an essential fat. So this list here um, will just help give you a little bit more guidance towards that. So the essential fats is here on the left, many of which I've already spoken about, um, the oils, and the margarines and the mayonnaise. Um, what I haven't mentioned is black seed oil, fish oil, and cold water fish such as salmon, trout, and mackerel and sardines. These type of fish all have um, they have they're high in this essential fat. You may be more um, aware of this fat in the form of um, the name omega three. So what you're looking at on this is both omega three and omega sixes. And those are the type of fats that, again, your body can't make on its own, and you're going to be looking for sources. Now, if you're on parenteral nutrition on, to, on TPN and you are able to uh, receive IV lipid, you are getting essential fat. Um, but I spend so much time on this topic because the goal is always to get consumers off of as much parenteral nutrition as possible. So when educating on the short bowel diet, we always want to make sure that you know where to get your essential fats from so that you can begin to incorporate it into the diet with the hopes that you are going to be eating some PPN. Um, and there may be a time that you have to go without some IV lipids, so it's good to know that you can get it in the diet. And the non-essential fat that I spoke about, saturated fat, the only other type of fat that I haven't mentioned is monounsaturated fat. And that type of fat is unlike saturated fat in that um, saturated fat I mentioned is correlated with you know, heart disease and not the best choice. So those are things at the top of the list like butter, and cocoa butter, whole milk, red meat. But those at the bottom of the list, olive oil, canola oil, peanut oil, these are healthy oils. They just don't contain essential fat. So if you're someone that loves olive oil, you certainly can use olive oil. Just remember you don't want it to be the only source of oil that you use because it doesn't contain essential fat. And the same with canola oil. A great choice because the mono and saturated fats are a good choice. That's the Mediterranean diet that you know we often hear about. 
There, it's a great choice of oil. It just can't be your sole source, especially if you're somebody that's not on a lot of TPN or not on any IV lipid. You're not getting a sources of essential fat. And because those with short bowels malabsorb fat, your fat needs are, are higher. So that's why we, we spend so much time on this topic. Okay. Uh, so these are ways to, uh, to further drive home the point of essential fats and their importance, just ways to increase essential fats in the diet that you may have not thought of, you know, just little ways. And you'll see the doses that we're talking about are teaspoons. So a teaspoon of what we call an S oil, the soybean, um, the soybean oil, the sunflower oil, um, or the safflower oil. Though there's a caveat with safflower oil because it used to always be made with polyunsaturated fat, and now um, it commonly is not. So you have to be careful with safflower oil and really look at the ingredient list. The good news is is that when you look at a label, it breaks down the fat grams for you, and it's going to tell you how much polyunsaturated fat, how much monounsaturated fat. So you know where the fat is coming from. Um, so you're, you, you should be able to look at the label and then figure out if it is a source, a good source or not of, um, of the polyunsaturated fat. And basically what you, you want to be seeing is that of the total fat grams, um, if it says there's 11 grams of fat per tablespoon, you want to make sure the majority of those 11 grams are coming from polyunsaturated. Um, so, you know, adding an, an S oil to a serving of pasta or, you know, to some oatmeal, um, using some extra mayonnaise, you know, with your tuna or your chicken um, salads that you're making. And when I say salads, I mean you know, the tuna mixed with mayonnaise or the chicken mixed with mayonnaise, not actually lettuce. Um, marinating your meats in an oil-based salad dressing. So these are all just some small ways that really do add up as the day goes on. And these are ways to keep the essential fat in all throughout um, your, the course of the day. Okay, so I do the recommended diet, um, actual prescription, and we've talked about the specific foods and the macronutrients. And the last point that I just want to make is that um, you can think that you're following an appropriate diet um, just based on the prescription that maybe you've been prescribed. You know, when I mentioned that 50% carbohydrate and you know, 30 percent, 20 to 30 percent protein, 20 to 30 percent fat. Especially nowadays, with phone apps and different ways to monitor, you know, to monitor your eating, uh, it's it's quite possible that you could be on the right prescription, but actually be not choosing the most appropriate food. So what you're seeing here is an example of that. This is again work that came out of the Nutritional Research Center, but it, the point is. Uh, that we're trying to emphasize here is that it is possible for a consumer to be compliant to a prescribed diet, but to actually consume the wrong food. So in comparing these two meal patterns, the one on the left is appropriate and the one on the right is less appropriate. And what we're comparing here is two meal patterns based upon the exact same diet prescription. So both diets contain 2,400 calories, 50% carbohydrate, 20% protein, and 30% fat. But diet number one, and I'm going to actually toggle between two screens here because the next, I've got the first few meals on slide one and then the next couple um, on slide two. So in diet one distributes the food throughout the day. As you can see here, the meals are very balanced, emphasizing a source of protein and fat, especially essential fat at each meal and snack. Um, complex carbohydrates are emphasized and simple sugars are restricted, and fluids are either hyperosmolar or hypertonic. Um, so these meals are balanced and evenly distributed, um, and therefore this menu pattern is better tolerated than in diet number two. I'm just switching back so you can see the beginnings of, of diet number two, the less So although the daily total amount of carbohydrate, protein, and fat is comparable in both diets, here in diet number two, um, it, there, the um, food is not distributed well throughout the day. For example, you'll see that um, at breakfast, there's really very minimal protein. Um, the majority of the protein, actually, I'm just going to go ahead here to the second screen, is in the dinner meal um, in that 12-ounce serving of the T-bone steak. Um, and as a result of this, um, other meals are, you know, primarily carbohydrate and fat. 
also too much carbohydrate and too much fat over a short period of time can result in an increase in diarrhea. And also the consumption of high sugar beverages, you saw here that um, at lunchtime, um, the, this diet has pizza paired with 12 ounces of regular soda. So it's just not gonna be particularly well tolerated with that volume of a regular soda with all of that sugar. And at breakfast time, I mentioned no protein, but there, um, in addition to there being no protein, it's a very high sugar uh, meal between the orange juice and the Danish. Um, so I think it's a really um, important point that this, you know, you could easily be following, just again, I can't emphasize enough, the exact same or correct prescription that you've been prescribed and not be choosing and distributing the, you know, the foods um, throughout the day. And although these are the same prescriptions, uh, your success will greatly depend on how you're combining your food and fluid um, throughout the course of the day. In our experience, a consumer following the example of an inappropriate diet is going to have greater stool output and likely higher needs for IV fluid and TPN. Um, and this is really the number one reason that, you know, at ThriveRx and certainly as, as a dietitian, I emphasize uh, diet education and the tremendous impact that fluid choices can have on overall quality of life. Uh, you know, really from the amount of time spent in the bathroom, um, to the, the need for IV support, um, it, it is tremendously dependent upon um, food selection and why you know, we've gone as far as develop a, a program called Maximize Health where we're working with patients individually to apply these concepts based on the, you know, patients' specific anatomy, diet preferences, and lifestyle. So um, what I just wanted to mention, I talked a lot about the history of intestinal rehabilitation. I just want to continue to emphasize that this concept has grown over the years and diet and medication management continues to be part of the intestinal rehabilitation model at intestinal rehabilitation centers nationwide. Um, you know, so the concept of intestinal rehabilitation has grown from the early days back at the Nutritional Restart Center and includes parenteral and enteral nutrition management, the important diet and medication management, and if needed, further surgical intervention and transplantation. And diet continues to be an important part of this, um, this plan and the multidisciplinary team approach. And some of uh, the uh, leaders in the field of intestinal rehabilitation have emphasized this point. Dr. DeBase um, has uh, been quoted as saying that his clinical experience confirms the important role that diet plays in the successful management of these particularly those with home, suggesting that if it's appropriate follow-up and compliance, this can result in long-term reduction of parental nutrition needs. And um, Dr. Matteris, nutrition is an integral component of the care of these very complex and heterogeneous patients and forms the foundation for treatment. And Dr. Rudolph um, says there's currently no clinical consensus as to or if when to administer therapies such as growth hormone, glutamine, or GLP-2 in the intestinal failure population, but one therapy is currently employed to enhance intestinal adaptation central to the IR efforts, and that's the provision of enteral nutrition. So um, I know that from a, um, you know, being a dietitian, I'm, I'm biased, but I've had the uh, 20 plus years of experience to really see the impact that diet changes can have overall. Um, and if you're someone that, you know, has never really worked on diets, or maybe it's time to take a fresh look and maybe take a new focus on it, we, I hope that some of the information that I've shared today is going to be helpful for you. So in conclusion, for best practice eating, you want to be sure that um, your meal, all meals and snacks contain a source of complex carbohydrate, protein, and fat, especially essential fat. You want to emphasize complex carbohydrates and restrict simple sugars. You want to be sure that you're distributing your food throughout the day, um, like I was showing you in that example of appropriate versus inappropriate, really dividing the food up um, throughout the day and combining the food appropriately. And um, I haven't 
emphasize this point as much, but restricting fluid at mealtime can be very important as well. Um, as you were looking in, at the diet um, of the appropriate diet, uh, that was another point that was emphasized that four ounces of fluid per meal is, is recommended um, in order to prevent the fluid from pushing the food right through. So with that, I just want to, the last thing I want to say is that the short bowel diet can impact um, better absorption and improved hydration. It can lead to less parental nutrition and IV hydration needs and ultimately improved quality of life, which is, of course, a, 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 um, in our daily work um, with you all. So with that, I'd love to answer any questions you all have, and I am just very appreciative of this opportunity to join you um, remotely today. Thank you, Maria. I don't know if we have any questions in the audience while we have Maria on the phone. No, it doesn't look okay. We do. So I just want to say thank you, Maria, for joining us today. We appreciate you taking your time out of your schedule. Well, thank you. And so for share my information. Take care. Yes, yeah, thank you so much.